Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown, and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go. You see, I've always been the type to see the good in everyone, no matter how difficult they might be. For years, I made excuses for her behavior, convinced that deep down she must have a kind heart. But as time went on, I slowly came to realize that some people are just rotten to the core. My husband and I met in college. He was this quiet, kind-hearted guy who always seemed to be carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders. It wasn't until we'd been dating for a while that I started to understand why. His mother, who I'll call Karen because that's exactly what she is, had been emotionally abusive throughout his entire life. At first, I tried to bridge the gap between them. I thought maybe if I showed Karen enough kindness, she'd soften up and treat her son better. Instead of appreciating my efforts, she seemed to view me as competition for her son's affection. It was like dealing with a jealous ex-girlfriend, not a mother-in-law. As the years went by, Karen's demands on my husband grew more and more outrageous. She'd guilt him into giving her money, demand expensive gifts, and throw tantrums if she didn't get her way. My husband, bless his heart, always gave in, desperate for any scrap of maternal affection she might offer. But this last Christmas, something changed. Karen had demanded a $200 gift from my husband, even though she knew we were struggling financially. For the first time ever, he stood his ground and said no. I expressed my concern to my husband, reminding him of how his mother typically reacts when she doesn't get her way. However, my husband stated, that he was sure about his decision. He explained that we couldn't afford it and that he was tired of his mother treating us like her personal ATM. I was so proud of him for finally setting a boundary. What Karen didn't know was that my husband had been saving up for months to surprise me with a wedding ring upgrade and a beautiful diamond bracelet for Christmas. He'd worked extra shifts and cut back on his own expenses to make it happen. When Christmas Eve rolled around, I had a brilliant idea. I knew Karen would be coming over, and I wanted to make sure she noticed my new jewelry. So, I soaked both the ring and the bracelet in dish soap to make them extra shiny. As I was polishing them, my husband walked in. My husband asked what I was doing, and I explained that I was ensuring the jewelry would sparkle for his mother's visit. He laughed and lovingly called me terrible, expressing his amusement at my plan. When Karen arrived, I made sure to use my left hand for everything. Handing her a drink? Left hand. Brushing my hair back? Left hand. It didn't take long for her to notice. Karen inquired about what was on my hand. I enthusiastically showed off my new ring, explaining that it was an upgrade from her son. I also made sure to display the bracelet, mentioning that he had given it to me early for Christmas because I couldn't wait to wear it. Karen's face turned red as she asked if my husband had bought all of that for me. I gushed about how amazing and generous her son was, praising her for raising such a wonderful man. I mentioned that he spoils me so much and that I still had many gifts from him under the tree to open the next day. She looked furious and struggled to find words to express her anger. She then mentioned that my husband had told her he didn't have money for Christmas gifts that year. I feigned surprise at this information. I suggested that my husband probably wanted to ensure he could get something special for his mother before splurging on me, knowing how selfless he is. My husband, who had been quietly observing our exchange, finally spoke up. He confirmed to his mother that he had indeed told her the truth about not having money for expensive gifts. He explained that he had been saving for months to get these gifts for me because I deserved them. He apologized if it upset her, but said that his priority was his family, his wife, and their future. Karen's face went through a range of emotions, anger, envy, and finally, a realization that she was no longer the most important woman in her son's life. Without another word, she grabbed her purse and stormed out of our house. As the door slammed behind her, my husband and I looked at each other and burst out laughing. It felt like a weight had been lifted off both our shoulders. For the first time in years, we enjoyed a peaceful, Karen-free Christmas. My husband and I had tried for years to have a baby. 
going through rounds of fertility treatments that drained our savings and our spirits. When we finally welcomed our little girl into the world, it felt like a miracle. Those first few months were filled with sleepless nights and endless diaper changes, but we were over the moon. As spring arrived, I decided it was time to venture out to the local park. I figured some fresh air would do us both good. Little did I know this simple outing would spiral into the most terrifying experience of my life. It started innocently enough. I was sitting on a bench gently rocking the stroller when a woman approached. She cooed over my daughter, which wasn't unusual. People often stop to admire babies. The woman asked about my daughter's age, and I told her she was four months old. She complimented my baby, saying she was perfect and that her son would adore her. I smiled politely, thinking she meant her son would enjoy playing with a baby. But then things took a bizarre turn. To my shock, the woman asked how much I wanted for my baby. Confused, I asked her to repeat herself. She clarified that she wanted to buy my baby, explaining that her son had been asking for a sibling and she couldn't have more children. She thought my daughter would be perfect for their family. I stared at her, speechless, wondering if this was some kind of sick joke. I told her that my daughter was not for sale, emphasizing that she wasn't a toy or a pet, and asked her to leave us alone. The woman's demeanor changed, and she accused me of being selfish. She argued that I was young and could have more children, insisting that her son needed my baby more than I did. I stood up and started to push the stroller away. The woman grabbed my arm, refusing to let me leave, and insisting she was offering good money. I yanked my arm free and hurried out of the park, looking over my shoulder to make sure she wasn't following. Over the next few weeks, I started noticing a car parked across the street from our house. Sometimes I'd catch glimpses of the woman from the park watching us. I told my husband, and we installed security cameras, just in case. Then the phone call started. Child Protective Services showed up at our door, claiming they'd received reports of neglect. We were able to prove the allegations false, but it was clear who was behind them. The situation reached a breaking point when I received a letter in the mail. It was a fake adoption claim complete with forged signatures. I was horrified. We went to the police, but they said there wasn't enough evidence to do anything yet. One night, I woke up to the sound of breaking glass. My blood ran cold when I heard footsteps downstairs. I shook my husband awake and we crept to the nursery. There she was, the woman from the park, reaching into our daughter's crib. I shouted at her to get away from our baby. The woman spun around, clutching my baby to her chest. She declared that our daughter was hers now and that we couldn't keep her away anymore. My husband lunged forward trying to grab our daughter. I'd never seen such a wild look in someone's eyes as I did in that woman's face. She insisted that our baby belonged to her son and that we didn't deserve her. I hit the panic button on our security system and alarms blared through the house. The woman tried to run, but my husband blocked the doorway. Our neighbors, hearing the commotion, had already called the police. The woman kept shouting about how her son needed a sibling and that she had promised him. She accused us of ruining everything. She was still yelling when the police arrived. They had to pry my daughter from her arms. As they led her away in handcuffs, she continued screaming about how we were the ones in the wrong, how we were depriving her son of the sibling he deserved. The neighbors who'd gathered to watch were stunned. I could hear them whispering, trying to make sense of what they'd just witnessed. My legs gave out, and I sank to the ground, cradling my daughter and sobbing with relief. In the aftermath, we learned the full extent of the woman's obsession. She'd been stalking other families with young children, convinced that she had the right to take any baby she wanted for her son. The police found a nursery in her house, fully prepared for a kidnapped child. The trial was a media circus. Her lawyer tried to argue for mental health treatment instead of jail time, but given the premeditation and the terror she'd put multiple families through, the judge wasn't swayed. She was sentenced to years in prison with mandatory psychiatric care. It took a long time for us to feel safe again. We moved to a new neighborhood, one with a tight-knit community where everyone looked out for each other. Slowly, we started to heal. Now, when I take my daughter to the park, I'm always on alert, but I refuse to let fear control our lives. That woman may have tried to steal our joy, but in the end, she only made us stronger.
I've been working at this company for over a decade now. It's a big place with lots of employees, but in my department, there are only two other people whose roles directly impact mine. Let's call them the scheduler and the coordinator. My job is pretty unique. I'm the only person in the entire company who can cover both the scheduler and coordinator roles when they're off. It doesn't happen often, maybe three to five times a year during emergencies, but I'm always happy to help out. It's one of those things that makes me feel valuable, you know? Anyway, uh, about five years ago, I had this meeting with my boss about a pay raise. I thought it was going well. I was listing all the reasons why I deserved it, and I mentioned how I was the only one who could cover both the scheduler and coordinator at the same time. I figured it was a strong point in my favor, but then my boss got this weird look on his face. He told me that he didn't want me covering for the scheduler and coordinator anymore, and that I should just focus on my core responsibilities. I was shocked. I mean, I still got the raise, but it felt like he was trying to downplay my importance. Maybe he was worried I'd use it to ask for more money in the future. I don't know. I had a feeling this new rule would come back to bite him someday. So I did something I learned from browsing Reddit. I asked for it in writing. I requested that he send me an email confirming that I should no longer cover for the scheduler and coordinator. He agreed to send it right away, and he did. I saved that email just in case. Fast forward five years. I'm sitting at my desk when my boss comes rushing over, looking panicked. He explained that we had a problem because both the scheduler and coordinator were on vacation that day and he needed me to cover their shifts. I just looked at him trying not to smile. I reminded him of his instructions from five years ago, stating that I wasn't supposed to cover their responsibilities. He seemed confused, saying that it was five years ago and this was an emergency. I told him I understood but pointed out how clear he had been about it. I even mentioned that I had the email as proof. I pulled up the email on my computer and forwarded it to him, reminding him that I was supposed to focus on my core responsibilities. He just stood there, mouth open, staring at his phone as the email came through. He sputtered about needing someone to cover those shifts. I apologized and reiterated that those weren't my core responsibilities anymore, asking if there was someone else who could help. He walked out angrily. I felt a little bad, but also pretty satisfied. I mean, he made the rule, right? Later that day, I found out they had to call someone in on their day off to cover. It must have cost the company a fortune in overtime pay. A few weeks later, my boss called me into his office. He looked tired. He said we needed to talk about what happened the other day. When I asked what about it, he admitted that the rule he made five years ago was short-sighted. He acknowledged that I was the only person who could cover both those roles and they needed that flexibility. I agreed, reminding him that it had always been part of my job to help out in emergencies. He then officially rescinded the rule, authorizing me to cover for the scheduler and coordinator when needed. He also mentioned that they would be adjusting my compensation to reflect this responsibility. Not only was I getting my old duties back, but I was getting paid more for it too. I thanked him and asked if there was anything else. He said yes and apologized for how he handled the situation five years ago. He admitted that I was right to point out my unique skills and he shouldn't have tried to downplay them. He assured me it wouldn't happen again. I left his office feeling pretty good. It had taken five years, but finally, my boss understood my value. And all because I'd learned to document everything. Thanks, Reddit. I met my husband in college. We were both studying computer science, bonding over late-night coding sessions, and our shared love for video games. After graduation, we got married and started our careers in tech. Life was good, and we were excited about our future together. When we decided to have children, we knew it might be challenging, but we felt ready. Our first child came along, and two years later, we welcomed our second. It wasn't long before we noticed that both our kids were different from what we expected. After numerous doctor visits and evaluations, we learned that both our children were on the autism spectrum. The diagnosis was a turning point in our lives. I threw myself into researching, attending support groups, and finding the best ways to help our children thrive. My husband, on the other hand, seemed to retreat into his 
gaming world. He'd always been a gamer, but now it became his primary coping mechanism. As the kids grew, so did the challenges. I found myself handling most of the parenting duties while my husband spent more and more time glued to his computer. Which brings me to last week I was in the kitchen trying to prepare dinner while keeping an eye on the kids. They were in one of their restless moods, tipping over and climbing on the dining room chairs. These chairs aren't heavy, they're plastic and metal, but the noise and potential for injury were concerning. I called out to my husband, hoping he'd help redirect the kids, but he was too engrossed in his game. Instead of getting up, he started yelling at me from the other room. He angrily asked why I wasn't moving the chairs, insisting that I needed to take them to the day room after every meal. I explained that I couldn't move all four at once and that it was easier to move two at a time. He then demanded that I just do it, complaining that he couldn't concentrate with all the noise. His outburst left me fuming. The day room he mentioned is actually our unfinished garage that we use for storage. The previous owners had started converting it into an additional room, but never completed the job. Now my husband wanted me to lug chairs back and forth between rooms multiple times a day, just so he wouldn't be disturbed during his precious gaming time. That's when I decided to implement my secret policy. If the dining chairs had to go, so would his gaming chair. It was petty, I knew, but I was tired of being the only one making sacrifices for our family. For the next few days, I stuck to my plan. Whenever I needed to move the dining chairs, I'd also take his computer chair to the day room. When I brought the dining chairs back, his chair stayed put. Finally, the day came when he noticed. He'd just gotten home from work and, as usual, headed straight for his computer. I was in the kitchen starting dinner prep. He asked about the whereabouts of the dining chairs and I explained that I had moved them to the day room earlier because the kids were playing with them. He acknowledged this without much thought. I could hear him settling in for his nightly gaming session. He was trying to win some bonus for playing every day for a month. A few minutes passed before I heard him again. This time he was inquiring about his chair. I calmly informed him that it was in the day room with the others. When he asked why, I reminded him of his own words, saying that he had said all the chairs should go to the day room. I walked out of the kitchen just in time to see him standing there, mouth agape, like he expected me to drop everything and fetch his chair for him. I simply walked past him and continued with my chores. He didn't say anything else that night, but I could feel the tension in the air. The next day, when he came home from work, I noticed him checking for his chair before sitting down at the computer. When he saw it was there, he visibly relaxed. This little game of chair musical chairs continued for about a week. Sometimes his chair would be there, sometimes it wouldn't. He never outright asked me to bring it back, but I could tell it was bothering him. Finally, one evening, as I was putting the kids to bed, I overheard him muttering to himself as he trudged to the day room to retrieve his chair. When I came back downstairs, he was sitting at his computer, but he wasn't gaming. Instead, he turned to me with a sheepish look. He admitted that he now understood and apologized for yelling at me about the chairs, acknowledging that he didn't realize how much work it was. I thanked him for noticing and pointed out that it wasn't just about the chairs. He agreed, admitting that he had been checking out of our family life. We talked for hours that night, really talked, for the first time in years. He admitted he'd been using gaming as an escape from the challenges of raising our children. I shared how overwhelmed and alone I'd been feeling. It wasn't an instant fix, but it was a start. He promised to be more present, to help more with the kids and household chores. And I promised to communicate my frustrations better instead of resorting to passive-aggressive chair moving. And now we have reached the end of today's stories. Thank you for watching and see you next time.